Good. It's good to see each one of you this morning. I appreciate you being here. You could have chose to be anywhere else, but you chose to be with us, and I thank you today. Uh, this morning, where we open service, you can be turning to Luke chapter 19. And we're going to take some time this morning to talk about religious tests. And let me just go ahead and tell you where I took that from. You know, in our in our news feeds and all today, if you pay attention. <coughs> There, there is much to do about nothing going on, and, and certain people in our government, all they will begin talking about, you know, that when, when, when the Constitution, Article 6, says that senators, representatives, and members of state legislatures in all executive and judicial offices, uh, both the United States and the state shall be bound, uh, shall be bound by an oath or affirmation to support the Constitution, but no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any public office or public trust under the United States. They'll use that as a club to try and tell you, oh, you see that, that's a separation of church and state, and everybody knows that we're supposed to not have, uh, allow our religious views or our religious affiliation affect what we do or don't do. Let me go ahead and tell you right now, if your religion does not affect every part of your life, I want nothing to do with your religion. Amen. But of course, that, that's really not what the religious test clause is about. It is just saying that in our, in our nation, we're not going to require you to be anything to hold office. If you're, if you're of age, if you're willing and, and are willing to take the oath of office, you can serve. We're not going to require you to be a Presbyterian or a Baptist or a Methodist or a Pentecostal, but we're not going to hold you to anything like that. We're not going to have a religious test uh, before you can hold office. That's what that means. Would y'all like some good news this morning? Conversely speaking, your religion, especially our founders were talking about the Christian belief is not a disqualifier of holding office. But you listen to me, just because this is all the politics I'm going to talk about today, uh, Islam and any other religious system that cannot or will not uphold or support the Constitution is a disqualifier to holding public office. Amen. Y'all ready for the next set of good news? That has nothing to do with the message today. Amen. Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 37, says, And when he was come nigh, even now, at the descent of the Mount of Olives, uh, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is he, or blessed be the king that comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven, and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this day, the things which belong unto thy people, but now they are hid from thine eyes. Lord, help us today. You see, my intent today is to look at the response of certain people uh, during the triumphal entry of Christ. You see, last week we talked about the tale of two donkeys. And, you know, simply put, this is Jesus coming into Jerusalem and he is fulfilling Old Testament prophecy. It, the Lord had given us hints in the Old Testament that when we see the king coming, riding on a baby donkey, we would know we would know that this is the King of the Jews. The Messiah has come. <clears throat> the Lord hasn't hidden these things. I mean, he's, well, he's hid them. He's just hid them in plain sight, which is the best place to hide anything from me. Huh? Let me explain that to you. This morning, I had to do a little extra running, which I had not intended to do. And I got back home, and I'm going to have my last cup of coffee at last 22 and a half ounces or so with some oatmeal mixed in it. I took two drinks and set it down. And I don't know exactly how long I looked for it, but do you know where it was? Right where I left it, sitting on top of the smart of it. Eye level. <laughs> huh? 
You want to hide something from somebody? Hide it in plain sight, man. You don't have to try to hide it. And the Lord does what He does. He gave the, the, the Israelites, He gave us in the Old Testament, He gave us all this information that we would know. Not that we would guess, not that we would hope, but He has given us information that we might know. So today as we, as we look at that and, and just understanding that I believe everybody in here has a basic understanding that when Jesus came into Jerusalem the last time, many people saw him and knew who and what he was. See, but today what I want to tell you is, is that I think if you pay attention to the people going on or what they were doing in that day, uh, we can perform what I would call some, some religious tests of our own and just see where we are. Amen. Is that biblical? Absolutely. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, Examine yourselves. Whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know you not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobate. You need to be sure where you stand with Jesus Christ. You see, I'm not going to judge your salvation. That's not my job. Okay, that's not my position, but I will tell you that if you are unsure, you need to be sure. 1 Corinthians 11, 28, Paul speaks to the men and women there who were partaking of the Lord's Supper unworthy, is what he called it. And he tells them to examine yourselves before you come in here and do something stupid. Psalm 26, 2 says, examine me, O Lord, and prove me that my reigns and my heart. Try my reins in my heart. Lord, Lord, make sure that I am right with you. And I don't have any problem with that. You see, I don't expect you to do it openly. I don't expect you to, to broadcast it. But in the, in the quietness of your own heart, you should always be going about the business of examining yourself. And there's just some things that you can use. Number one, do not use other people. If you think you're going to aspire to be like the televangelist that you idolize, you are not going to be there. Sorry. Don't do that. If you think that you are going to live up to the standard of mama or papa or whoever it is that you hold in such high regard because they were the standard, you listen to me. Don't do that. Because the Word of God has given us clear direction that this Bible, the, the Word of God, the inerrant, God-breathed Word of God is our plumb line. And if you don't like the word plumb line, we'll call it a control line. If you want something that is constant and sure that you can base everything you do on and know you're right, you make sure it lines up with the Word of God and everything will be fine from there. Amen. Look, you can be as interactive as you want, or I'll just preach myself happy. Can I get amen? Because I'm preaching better than you amen it already. But see, now, uh, here's the thing. If I'm going to do the, the things that are in the Bible, I've got to pay attention to a number of things. Number one, I'm going to pay attention to the commands and do them. When the Lord gives prohibitions and tells me to avoid something, I'm just going to take him at his word and say, I probably shouldn't do that. He's trying to save me some pain. And then as I uncover the principles of the Word of God, because His command says that I should be in His Word, I should be trying to seek after Him, as I learn the principles, I should be able to apply them to my life and just see the blessings of God as I walk it out. See, but in our story today, we're going to talk about four people or four people types that we can use to determine where we are, religiously speaking. And everybody in here understands that I, I really could care less about religion. I, I, I truly love Jesus Christ. I appreciate the grace and the mercy it's shown me. And, and the Lord has brought me from a dark place. I've been born again, saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. You know what I'm talking about? That is my testimony today. So when I start talking about religious tests, please take it for what it is. I'm giving you just some, some guidelines to help. But the first people that, that I'm going to call out here, the first people group, I'm going to call them the absent. You see, in this, in this whole scenario, there is a group of people that are conspicuously missing. Because they are not spoken of, that's why I'm calling them the absence. And by way of omission, I will tell you that I am very aware that they're there. You see, in our, in our world today, and I did not realize this until I had to work with a bunch of them, that there is a group, a very common group in our world today that when asked 
what is your religious affiliation? They answer with one word. None. None. They're not mad at God. They're not necessarily an atheist. They're not necessarily agnostic. They just don't care. They have no interest in religious activities. They have no religious leanings one way or another. And, and you know, to be quite honest with you, some of them are very sincere when you approach them about their non-religious beliefs. You can talk to them and present the gospel to them and they'll tell you, thank you and appreciate you being polite and taking the time to talk to me, but I'm just not interested. So that, that is a group of people that I have no doubt existed in Jesus' day. And they're not, they're not there. They're absent. But see, among this group also is the, the other subgroup of the nuns. It's the group that I call the used to be. Uh, that there are among the nuns a percentage of people who, when you begin to talk to them about the Lord, you talk to them about biblical things, they will almost automatically default and say, You know, I used to be in church, I used to be a Christian. Uh, I used to praise, I used to pray, I used to read. They are the used to be. As Frank Turk says, he says that, and this is his word, he says, about 50% of children who were raised in the church fall away from their faith because they let somebody else talk them out of their faith. And the only way you can talk somebody out of their faith is if they've never been talked into it. That's Frank Turk. You see, what happens is, is they, they've been raised up in the fear and the admission of the Lord, but they have not had a personal experience with Jesus Christ. And when they get with somebody who is more fervent than they are, they just relent and go with the flood. See, because if, they're not been, if they have not been made alive in Jesus Christ, listen to me, an old dead stick will go with the flood. It takes life to swim against the stream. Everybody see what I'm saying? When the tide of life comes, you are going to have to be strong in the Lord. Amen. That's why you've got to do these religious tests periodically. All right, the next sub-branch off of these nuns are the people that I call the hurt. That They have been hurt in church. They've had a bad experience. Or, or somebody planted a seed of doubt in their mind, and it was watered. Watered by the disinterest of people in the church. Lukewarm Christians. They find themselves looking around and seeing that Christians have no interest in the poor. They have no, no outreach to the suffering. Or just plain old fashioned unmet expectations run them away from church. The, the common saying is, as they look around at other people and they say, if this is Christianity, count me out. They're the hurt. You see, what they will also say is I will not be subject to going to church with a bunch of hypocrites. Why not? We've got plenty of room for more hypocrites, son. Come on in. We're going to keep preaching the Word of God and being faithful in that and that alone. We're not going to cast judgment on you. We're going to tell you the truth of the Word of God. But there's this familiar meme going around the internet, and, and it makes me a little bit nervous to say it, but let me go ahead and tell you like this. It's true. It's, it goes like this. If being hurt by people in the church causes you to quit church, then your faith was in people, not Jesus. So the Lord didn't call me to be successful. He called me to be faithful. In work, He didn't call me to be successful. He called me to be faithful. In my family, he didn't call me to be successful. He called me to be faithful. Whether you're talking about this church, whatever it is he has called you to do, he has called you to be faithful in that. Success is left up to him. Put your mind to it. Do what he says do. Have faith and leave the results up to him because he is trustworthy today. Do you know what I trust God to do more than anything else? Our study on Wednesday night has helped me to understand one thing. I need to trust God to do what's right and trust God to do what's best, even if I can't see it, even if I'm blinded to it, even when they die. Lord, I'm just going to trust you to do what is right and trust you to do what's best. Now, here comes subset C, if you're keeping up. 
These are the ones that don't like me and I usually don't like them back. I love them and witness to them, but they don't like me because I got answers for them. And that is the group that I call atheists. See, let me go ahead and tell you like this. There is a modern version of atheists that I don't like because they are militant and they are angry. Hmm? You see, they have a mantra. They will tell you with all the venom they have, there is no God and I hate Him. Just a note of observation. Uh, at one time, atheism was stigmatized. People would have thought you strange if you would have dared say, oh, I don't believe in God. Are you stupid? Are you, are you, are you dumb? What are you talking about you don't believe in God? Come on, man. That's dumb. Three-year-olds got enough sense to know there's a God. But we don't stigmatize it anymore, do we? No, no, no. We, we, have, we have made it uh, sophisticated to not believe in God. You see, there is a universal understanding that there is a God, whether you believe it or not. I'll tell you like this. I don't have enough faith to believe in atheists. And I'll tell you like this. God don't believe in atheists. Because there's coming a day when every person will stand before him and every knee will bow. And they will confess Jesus is Lord. They will know. They will have no doubt. And when I tell you that I don't like them, it's not that I don't like the person. I don't like the human being because I love them. I do not like the attitude. I do not like the anger. I do not like the venom. You see, but of course it has become in vogue. It's trendy. For some reason it seems to be, once you use one of the old words, it seems to be hip to be an atheist. Or at least to claim to not believe in God. I don't know who did it or how they did it, but somebody has made it sound smart or intelligent to be an atheist, and that's just dumb. I can tell you that I know God doesn't believe in atheists because of Romans chapter 1. You can turn there if you want to or just wait. In Romans chapter 1, verse 19, it says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God showed it unto them. From the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Everyone has an intuitive knowledge built in somewhere down here. They know there's something else, but they choose to ignore it. You know, a person has to ignore all kinds of overwhelming evidence to convince themselves there is no God. See, it's pretty simple. Uh, mainly because I've been a builder for a long time and been around builders. When I go to downtown Mobile and I look at a building, I know there was a building because the building, or the builder because the building exists. See, when I look around at creation, I see the birds, I see the people, I see the, the vast numbers of different kinds of canines and felines and rats and bugs and Lord, what were you thinking when you came up with love bugs? And I say, there has to be a God. There's nothing, there's nothing out there that would ever convince me that there's not a God in heaven. But of course, what happens is, is they have convinced themselves, and where the anger comes from, I'm going to give you all what I believe based on Scripture. I believe that the, the anger that is coming out of these new atheists is what I'll call them. Agree with Romans chapter 2, verse 13 through 15. It says, For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things uh, contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience, also bearing witness in their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. You see, the law of God, the moral law, is written on our hearts and our conscience bears witness to it. And you must go against your conscience. Everybody know what conscience means? It's made up of two words. Con meaning with, science meaning knowledge. Every time we sin against God, we do it with knowledge. We intuitively know that lying is wrong. We intuitively know that stealing is wrong. 
We intuitively know that dishonoring our parents is wrong and will get you hurt in the right circumstances. Amen. See, our conscience bears witness in it, and it is making them angry because they want to lie and they want to steal. They want to do the things that are contrary to God. But they have to fight all the time with that stupid conscience. I don't like it. Do you know why most people want to be atheists? It's pretty simple. They want to be atheists because they don't want there to be a God. The same reason a criminal does not want there to be a policeman sitting on the corner. They like speeding. They like stealing. They like raping and murdering. They don't want any accountability in their life. If there's no God, I can live however I want to and pay no consequences. Amen. Yes. Sad but true. But you listen to me. If you really want to know what an atheist is, if you want to give a biblical definition to an atheist, it is one word. Fool. Fool. See, in, in uh, Psalms 14.1 and 53.1, it says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. It says they are corrupt. They have, uh, they have done abominable works. And there's none that does good. If you want to know what an atheist is, just use the word fool. Because you have got to be pretty fool, foolish. Or, I don't mean to be as coarse as I am. I'm about like 80 grit sandpaper. But it's dumb to be an atheist. It's just dumb. I, like I said, I, I guarantee you, my, my youngest children know. They know it. They know there's a God. You have to take time to talk them out of it. But see, the Bible says, the Bible says that the heavens declare the glory of God. See, see, last week we were talking about aliens and UFOs and stuff. Man, that is, oh, that's an awesome study. If you get a chance to listen to it, go check it out. Full of lots of information that will be useless anywhere else except in that study. But you listen to me. Do you know why I don't care about UFOs and alien life? Because the, the universe is so vast. You know, we have the, the images on these pictures and things. They're nothing more than imagination of men, mankind. Billions and billions and billions of miles, and they still haven't reached the end of, the, of our galaxy, much less the universe. They're guessing at what's out there, and you're telling me there's no God? Come on, man. You, you're, you're like accusing me of being dumb. No, thank you. And be sure of this religion, or atheism, is a religion. It's, I mean, it's a belief. You have to believe there's no God. And they would argue with you and say, oh, no, that's just not the way it works. No, I'm just telling you. And when you encounter an atheist, that's what you need to do. When did you start to believe? And they'll go, what do you mean? When did you start believing the, 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 uh, the very bad understanding that nothing created everything? That's intellectually dishonest, okay? That's a belief. You believe in evolution. You have to believe it. You have to believe it with blind faith. You see, I am a product of not blind faith, but faith that shines the light in the darkness. The Word of God opens up this world and says it is a lamp unto my feet. I don't step in the darkness. I step into the light. Glory to God. Amen. Hmm. You see, Jesus came into the temple and to the Jerusalem that day, riding the donkey, fulfilling unquestionably the prophecy in the Old Testament. And they could not and they would not be moved. And they wouldn't even bother looking Jesus' way. Those that are absent, I'll ask you this, none of us in this house would even fit that crowd, would we? Surely we would. We've shown up for church. We were happy to see a baby dedicated. Because we know God's real. And ain't nobody going to talk us out of it. You see, but those that will not come to Jesus, those that will not even seek Him out when He is absolutely present, no doubt that Jesus is moving. They're doing nothing more than fulfilling Romans 3.11b. He says, there is none that seek God. You see, what they're doing is, is they're doing what the television and the movie has told them for years. Just follow your heart. Follow your heart. Have y'all ever heard that? You know, just follow your heart. Don't do Don't be dumb. Don't do that. Do not follow your heart. The Bible says the heart is wicked. Desperately wicked. 
And the Proverbs 28, 26 says, He that trusts in his own heart is a fool. Fool equals atheist. Atheist equals fool. Don't trust your own heart. Trust God and trust his word. Amen. So that's the first religious test. Do you seek Jesus when he's around? Do you seek Jesus when he's not around? Do you respond to his presence? Or do you run? Or are you just not interested? It's not my business. I'm just telling you, that's a test that I would might would uh, look into periodically, especially if you call yourself a Christian in name only. Might be time to get right with God. Now the second second group of people here are the ones that we see because in, in Luke chapter 19 it says when Jesus comes in, it says, well first of all they were spreading their clothes in the way and it says that they began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. So I'm going to call these the responsive believers. In other words, these are people who believe in God and when Jesus shows up and when there is obvious evidence that it's God, they respond. You know people like that. They're Christians. But it doesn't even show up in their life until tragedy comes or until they're in a revival service. See, see I grew up with a Baptist background. And one of the most comical things that I have, I mean, I, I'm not affiliated with any denomination at all right now. And it won't be unless the Lord really leads me that direction. And he knows that's going to be an argument, so this is it for me. But one of the things that I found most comical is Baptists didn't move during service. The churches I went, they wore three-piece suits. Every man that was saved wore a suit. And if you cried, you were saved. You know what I'm talking about? Well, no doubt they didn't raise hands, they didn't clap, but they would sing under their breath until revival meetings. And then they bring cowbells, son. We would have a glorious time in the Lord. Why? Because all of a sudden they were free and they knew the presence of Jesus is what they needed and they responded to it. It's a glorious time. So I just say nominal believers out there will respond when Jesus shows up. You see, what it says in John chapter 12 is, is that they came to see Lazarus. They came to see the man Jesus had raised from the dead. His mighty acts had drawn them to where he was. It's an awesome thing to know that Jesus is moving. Jesus is working in lives, not because you get to see the works. From my point of view, it's when people start running to him, if nothing else, just to observe his goodness. Because it is the goodness of God that draws men to repentance. You see, they do three things that I can tell you immediately. First thing is, is they acknowledge what and who Jesus is by way of sacrifice. They come and they begin to throw their clothes in the way. Man, first of all, I don't have a lot of clothes to be throwing. Huh? But they do. They become take, they've taken their cloaks and anything they can do to put in the way because they wanted the road carpeted because Lord knows the king of the Jews should not be walking in the filth. It was a show of reverence. They were willing to give up something for the king. That is nothing more than sacrifice, sacrificial giving. And then some of them started doing what I call acts of worship. It says the ones that didn't have clothes to throw down, probably at the hotel, they begin to run to the palm trees and cut down palm branches and bring them and throw them in the way. Why? Because Jesus is worthy of our worship. Amen. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords and He has proved it time and time again. Surely He is worthy of our worship. Surely He's worthy of your time. Surely He's worthy of your labor. You see, they come bringing palm branches because palm branches represent peace. And Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And then they do something that I know offends many people. They begin to praise God with a loud voice. Let me tell you a little secret. And this, this is one of those things we can agree to disagree if you like. But you can worship any way you want. You can worship at work. 
You can worship at home. You can worship silently. You can worship in your car. You can make anything and everything you do an act of worship dedicated to the Lord, right? Colossians 3.23 says, Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord, not as unto men. You can make anything worship, but only praise is praise. Huh? You're thinking, well, that just that sounds too simple. Okay. When's the last time, maybe even by yourself, if you're just self-conscious like me, you got to pondering and thinking and studying on the goodness of God. Like me just sitting there this morning, have to contain all the, the joy and the aggravation, and because it's all, all mixed up, I'm not compartmentalized. I'm just one big wheelbarrow. All the emotions go into one pot. Huh? Just say it. It's the way it is. But there are mornings when I have to just keep it to myself because I get up early and pray so I don't wake the whole house up. But when I start thinking about how good Jesus has been to me, I think about the people he's brought into my life. No doubt, every, every divine appointment. Y'all know who you are. You are divine appointments in my life. I will find myself going glory to God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Why? Because all of a sudden, when I realize how much He has done for me, it wants to come out in noise. Praise is noisy. Psalm 150 says, Praise Him on the high cymbals. Praise Him with the drums. Praise Him with the dance. Praise is noisy. Yes. Glory to God. Glory to God. Listen to me. I'm all about worship, son, because worship just says I'm making him greater than me. I'm making sure everybody knows that as I bow down and humble myself, I'm saying he's better than me. He's greater than me. He's more powerful than me. But when I praise, I want him to hear me and know my heart. I think about Jacob out there on that plane. Had an experience with God that I had never had. Laying out there with his head on a rock. On a rock. Wouldn't you have loved him in his chiropractor? And it says in a dream, he just all of a sudden, he, he looked up and there was a stairway to heaven. Jacob's ladder, some people call it. And at the top of it was the Lord himself. And he saw the angels ascending and descending, coming back and forth, bringing the good news. And when he woke up, he began to praise and say things like, the Lord is in this place. You see, even just regular old-fashioned believers, when Jesus shows up, can and will respond with praise. Open your mouth, son. You want to bless somebody and get a blessing yourself? Praise God. Praise Him out loud. Praise Him where everybody can see. You see, religious test number two. How do you respond when Jesus shows up? You see, 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says God loves a cheerful giver. When, when all of a sudden the Lord is beginning to move on your heart, are you willing to give? I ain't talking about money. I'm talking about just are you willing to give? Are you willing to give up your time? Are you willing to give up that attitude? Are you willing to give up that ego, that pride? Are you willing to give it? Or are you willing to worship Him? And do you praise Him? I said, no condemnation for me. I'm just saying that's a good test maybe you ought to think about it. Huh? Amen. Sacrifice, worship, huh? Do they hear your prayers? Now the third group of people is the one that I probably have the most trouble with, and they don't like me, and I don't like them back about the same way atheists are. And they are the Pharisees. Now if you don't if you don't want to be Pharisees, we can make it the Sadducees, but the story says in Luke 19 that some of the Pharisees came to Jesus and they were upset. They were mad that, that, that these people would actually praise Jesus, that they would give him honor. So Pharisees equal legalists. Legalists will tell you that you have to do it my way, when I do it, how I do it, and how I describe it for you. If you don't follow my tradition, you're going to hell, my friend. As Brother Charles McKinney would say, you see, what the scripture tells us is, is that they love to have the preeminence. Legalists love to be seen. Jesus and John both described them as a, well, they described them as snakes 
and devils. Pharisees, you are like whitewashed sepulchers full of dead men's bones. You see, they were interested in Jesus. They were. They believed. But their trust was solely in themselves and their own works. See, it is, it is seen in how they interacted with Jesus. How they spoke about Jesus. They, do you know what they said about Jesus, the Pharisees, that is? They talked about Jesus this way. They would look down their noses at him and say, he's a drunkard. He's a glutton. And can you believe he's a friend of sinners? Why would they think that? Because on this earth, the bridegroom lived it up. Jesus was reaching out. He did not deprive himself. He was a man. He was, he was God in the flesh. He was able to reach out and be amongst the people without the people affecting him. And the Pharisees couldn't stand it. See, Pharisees never want you to have a good time in Jesus. Pharisees will tell you to sit on your hands. Pharisees will tell you you've got to be quiet. Pharisees will tell you to pray too long. Pharisees will say, Philip, you preach too long. Amen. <laughs> I did set a timer today. I let it matter. <laughs> you see, I can tell you that Pharisees don't like Jesus and they don't like what the people are doing because they respond with indignation. And that's what Pharisees do. They are indignant about everything and they resent anything, man. Do you know what the attitude is? And, and you know, class warfare is not a new thing. Pharisees would have been considered the closest thing to a middle class. Bless you. Would have been considered the closest thing to a middle class that you would find in that day. In other words, they were craftsmen a lot of times. But they were rich. And they were religious and legalistic. But their problem was is they could not get a grasp on it. That some lowly carpenter, just a lowly carpenter from Nowheresville, Nazareth of Galilee, would allow these people, especially his disciples, to give him honor. They were, they were just disgusted at the fact that this laborer would allow these people to claim he is the Messiah. How dare him? You see, if it doesn't match their dogma, it is unacceptable. You see, God gives us three rules when it comes to worship, when it comes to a lot of things in the church, okay? If, if you don't like the order of worship, just remember this. God gives me three rules that I follow. Number one, is it honoring to God? Anything I do in my life, especially worship, does it honor God? Number two, it's got to be done decently and in order. After that, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. You see, here's the thing. I'm not going to fuss and argue with you how we do church. But I'm going to tell you right now, the Word of God tells you that you must love Jesus. He tells you that you must repent and trust in Jesus. But you know, even their protest makes an admission that they wouldn't believe. When they come and say, Jesus, you need to get these people to stop doing this. Even in that, they're acknowledging his power and his authority. Huh? See, because they know that he has shown both throughout the entire ministry of this earth. He's calmed the sea. Huh? He has raised the dead, opened the blind eyes. He has opened the deaf ears. He has got the man who couldn't talk, got him where he could talk, man. And of course, in this moment, we have probably one of the most cliche Christian sayings that we all use at some point or another. If we don't praise, huh? oh, if we don't praise Jesus, the rocks will cry out, right? Ain't no rock going to take my place. Glory to God. I'm, I'm down with that. You see, what happens here, though, is, is that Jesus is telling these men that this moment in time is just so pregnant with truth. It is so pregnant with opportunity that the power of God would not be stopped. Not even by that. But let me go ahead and tell you right now, your indignation and your, your resentment toward the goodness of God will not stop the praises of God. You 
see, we, as it says in Hebrews chapter 12, 1, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness that we ought always be apt to praise the Almighty God. We ought always be ready to acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God, the Son of Man, uh, that He is God on earth, that He is the Savior, Healer, Sanctifier, Justifier, Glorifier, and the soon coming King. Why? Because we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witness. So the religious test number three is, are you a Pharisee? Are you moved by love or are you moved by resentment? Are you, are you willing to let even those sorry sinners praise God? Are you, are you willing to let the ones that don't look like you, talk like you, sound like you, believe like you, are you willing to let them worship the way they would? If you say no, you're probably a Pharisee. You see, Lord, I, I pray today, don't let me ever become legalistic in how I deal with people. Lord, don't let me ever fold up to some religious organization. That's enough of that. Number four, and this is the one we all strive for, is the fourth person we see here is Jesus himself. In verse 41 it says, When he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou had known. You see, Jesus is our example. Jesus came to his own and his own received him not as what John chapter 1 says. It says he came and was trying his best to love them and show them compassion and draw them into the kingdom. It said they ignored him and crucified him. But Jesus didn't let their hate for him get in the way of his purpose, which was to seek and to save that which was lost. And it said he sat in that, that, that place looking over the city and the second time the scripture declares it, Jesus wept. The other time that he wept is when he saw the non-faith of those when he got ready to raise Lazarus from the dead. Overcome with emotion, he wept. Here, as he looks at the lost and wayward people that are supposed to be his, those that are supposed to be loyal to him, love him, who have been calling on him for a thousand years, he weeps over them. And one of the most powerful messages I've ever had come to me, I haven't had a chance to preach it yet. But as if you only knew. When Jesus is sitting on that well in Samaria, and that old Samaritan woman been married five times, shows up, and he says, give me a drink. <laughs> she said, who are you? Telling me to give you something to drink, Israelite. He said, honey, if you knew who was speaking to you, give me a drink and then I'd give you a drink and you'd be a well of water springing out of your soul. If you only knew. You see, Jesus' work in ministry has not changed. It is a seeking to save that which is lost. He has done his part. He has gone to the cross. He has been buried, resurrected the third day. He has sent his Holy Spirit to empower us and encourage us and energize us to do the work of ministry. You see, the religious test number four is quite simple. Do we weep over the lost? Do we weep? Are we moved with compassion to tears over those who ought to know God? Are we, are we moved with compassion? Do we weep over those angry atheists? Do we weep over the nuns? Do we weep over the Pharisees? Do we lose sleep over those who are going to hell? Do we lose sleep over the fact that Jesus says the fields are white, ready for harvest, but there's just not enough people to go? You see, Charles Spurgeon said it like this. He says, have you no, no wish for others to be saved? Then you're not saved yourself. Be sure of that. You see, we have been called with a divine calling to reach the lost at any cost. You see, our heart of sacrifice, our heart of worship, the praise that comes out of our mouths are evident of our response to Jesus Christ and knowing Him as Lord. But the more you get to know Him, the greater your burden ought to be for those that don't know Him. If you want to know what Jesus' heart is, 
Look at him sitting there overlooking Jerusalem. Those that are lost. Those that are undone in sin. And he is weeping. That's the test. Do you really care about the lost? You stand this morning. I'm, I'm, that's all I need to talk about. <laughs> Altars open this morning. We'll, we'll pray with you if you'd like, or you can, you can sit there and pray right by yourself. There's no condemnation, no pressure at all. But you hear me today, the Lord. The Lord is expecting us to be all that He's called us to be. He's given us everything we need. Is what Second uh, Peter chapter one tells: given us everything we need to live a godly life. So this morning, I just I do want you to contemplate. Don't bring it to me. Keep it to yourself and attend to Jesus. Well, let's pray. Father, I thank you today. Lord, I thank you for each soul here. And I, I pray that your word would, would do as, uh, as you said, that it would not return void. Lord, I pray that you would help us to look at ourselves and examine ourselves and be sure that we are in the faith. Lord, I pray that there, if there's none here, if there's any here today that is not saved, or any here that would answer the first question with none, I would just pray that you would let them see their need. Lord, understand your goodness and repent and trust in you. Lord, I pray that each one would get the, the, the grasp that eternity is the most important thing. I pray it all in Jesus' name.